Oh, good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live brought to you by Crowcast. Uh, nice to be with you again, and of course, joining us as usual, uh, our usual co cohorts, Donkey. How are you going, Donkey? Good, mate. How are you doing? I am very well. Uh, Pete, how are you? Good, Fane, yourself? Very good. And Macca, how's the letterbox situation down there? Took five days to get it replaced, babe, but we got a little cheap hoe that's in and, and working. Oh, you know, it was in the ground for, I tell you what, it wasn't in the ground for an hour and a half, and I got five bloody bills in it straight away. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you make me laugh, mate. <laughs> All right, well, look, without further ado, eh, let's get into uh, some news, shall we? The, what uh, have we got? Well, the main news that was um, floating around today, which um, involved um, Adelaide, was the news that, uh, uh, or the rumour that um, hitting the media that St Kilda are now have flagged their interest in Paul Seedsman, who has not um, yet uh, signed a, a new deal. Um, understand that the sticking point is um, <clears throat> the term of the deal. So uh, that's just one to watch as we head towards, um, and we'll discuss this a bit later on, I think, but as we head towards probably the most, one of the most important draft periods, I think, um, in recent memory for our club uh, this year. So I think uh, a player like that in demand um, may well be an interesting piece in that overall puzzle. Um, News floating around today also that Daniel Talia will go in for surgery. Tom Dude, of course, we know has a broken collarbone, so those seasons are ended. And we Why know didn't also Tars the text. go in last week? <clears throat> oh, well, a good question. I, I couldn't tell you, but um, it, it would have seen, you would think that uh, the sensible thing to do would have uh, been to get it done ASAP, unless they've only just realised that it needed to be done, which seems a bit hard to believe. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> but who would know? After this year, who would know? Who would guess? That's what was, that was my comment. was meant to say that, exactly that. The other news that came out was um, just recently, again, with plenty of Adelaide news around. And, um, uh, Fagan, Andrew Fagan was on um, on radio, came come out and uh, and supported the uh, – and also, as did Campo, um, both came out and supported – the current staffing and that uh, whilst there may be a little bit of an internal look at how things uh, went this year, there's not certainly not going to be any external review. There never has. There never will be an external review at the Adelaide Crows. Um, and um, effectively just uh, certainly throwing their support behind the fitness team. And um, and uh, I think Campo mentioned that uh, uh, all the right people were in the right seats on the bus. And uh, I guess if your ticket is tenured on that bus, then you probably would say that, wouldn't you? Um, what an I, absolute disgrace! No the chance bus of being kicked off. In the wrong <laughs> so, is that the bus that they played the Richem theme song on uh, beginning? Oh, of yeah, Guantanamo it, bus. It might have been. So, plenty of uh, plenty of stuff to get your teeth into there, lads. If you want to have a chat about any of those stories, well, the can first we kick one off is, with the review? Well, before just, we uh, we will definitely have a major crack at that donkey. But just before that, um, as a couple of people have pointed out on the chat. Um, and we do actually have the Spreaker chat streaming live on Facebook uh, uh, tonight as part of our cast. So people that are watching on Facebook can see some of the hilarity that goes on in the Spreaker chat. <laughs> um, but people are pointing out that um, Tars is only going to go in for surgery if he doesn't get up for this week's game. Oh, okay. Yep. Um, okay. Which is kind of bizarre because why would you bother? Like, yeah, so very strange. Classical. I mean, that key match against Carlton, you think our flag chances are arrested on it or something like that. I mean, this is ridiculous. I, I don't understand. We, uh, the, the minute that we couldn't make the uh, finals, anybody that needed an op should have been banged out and gone. Yeah, I, I don't get it. Uh, the, 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 the club has really disappointed me over the last week or so uh you know it, it folds into everything i guess that pete you you raised in in your little uh opening there uh, from selections to um uh, backing up the fitness staff to throwing the players under the bus in terms of all this rhetoric now where the players came back unfit at the beginning of the year etc 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 i just shake my head I, I i just don't there's no accountability there as far as i'm concerned 
Donkey, you want to have a crack at the uh, at the outset there? Yeah, look, for me, uh, as a few of you might know, I wrote to the club a couple of weeks ago asking for a fully external review. I had a lot of stipulations on what that needed to look at and what I had to look like. Uh, had to be, you know, someone with football gravitas um, that was from outside of the club, uh, having a look at all aspects of the club in terms of, you know, match day coaching. Like, why do we have those failures in the third quarter when we have 10-goal runs against us? All those sorts of things. Selection, um, you know, lift management, longevity of assistant coaches, all that sort of stuff. And and looking at what they've presented to us as a review is, um, you know, I, I take it as a personal affront. Um, but in reality, it's an affront against all of us for people that actually want to see, you know, what we're wrong with this year and why haven't we won a flag in 20 years, you know? And if we're not going to have these good, hard look at ourselves, we're never going to get there, you know? Just thinking back to 05, 06, 03, 2012, all those near misses, you know, 2017, all those near misses. And does anyone ever actually been held to account for the things that they mucked up and didn't get right, or what are we not doing right, or why do we keep falling short, you know? And if we're not going to go there, then it's just not good enough. Don, I just want to take this a bit further with you um, personally, because I think it's just interesting to hear the the anger and the passion in your voice. And I think that for any of the listeners that um, haven't been with us, um, that may have just joined us over the last few weeks, or haven't been with us all year, it's fair to say, mate, that you would be the most optimistic um, red blue and gold blooded supporter, you know, certainly on this cast <clears throat> and probably in our whole team, including Sunday night. And um, yeah, you, you absolutely believe the club. And you, of course, you are, you know, you have a position with the supporters club in the Northern Territory. So um, you have been very, very optimistic and you've defended the club at every um, uh, every juncture. And I think that it's just interesting that I can hear that, um, that frustration in, in your voice. It, you, look, I, I want to give our guys and our players and our staff every opportunity to, to get it right and get the job done and take us through to the promised land. And I do, uh, you know, and while the season is live, I'm, you know, I'm always going to do that. But when I continually see mistake after mistake and the wrong thing being done, even from such a remote um, uh, point of view from the club that I sit in, it, it, you start to wonder and you hope that the right decision is going to be made. But it's like, it's like watching your brother-in-law who's, you know, or your brother who's uh, got a bit of a problem with the drink. You know, you give them every opportunity to respond and back it up. But when they continue to make the same sort of mistakes, at some point you crack it and go, this is, it's just not good enough. And when you've got a season that has deteriorated and collapsed the way that it has, uh, and being not just normal things that have done it, we've, we've done training programs that haven't worked, we've sabotaged our squad, We've had lots of bad blood over this um, uh, collective minds thing. And the further it goes on and the more, you know, players like Richard Douglas even come out and say it was a disaster, just shows that, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, we weren't getting the full picture and we're getting, we're getting the concealment, um, which I understand for internal club operations sometimes, but somebody has to pay the price. If it's done to our club what it's done, somebody has to pay the price. And we can't allow these things to continue to keep going. And, you know, Don Pike needs to stand up as the head coach and say, this is my club and this is the direction I'm taking it. Or Andrew Fagan needs to go, I said I was going to deliver the best football partner in the world and so far I've delivered diddly squat. Somebody needs to take responsibility and say, I'm taking it somewhere. Now, I think that we, I still think we've got a great list. I don't think the window is shut. I don't think that it's all over forever. I do believe that there's, that it's within those players, but they're not getting the right support they need to get the wins on every day of the week. Well, Fiend, I'm just going to, can I just throw it over to you? Um, I, I know that through the week you've been outspoken just in terms of what you see as a bit of a disconnect that's emerged um, in the last week or so between the club and the players. And I think that that um, is um, characterised by the um, announcement by the club referring back to the condition that some of the players came back in. And also, um, and it was taken up, I think probably by Richard Douglas in his interview, where he um, threw things back in terms of uh, you know how they came back and the collective minds and, and all the rest of it. Do you think for f- first, do you think we, you know, I mean, we, I know that we ran a couple of episodes which d- were devoted to collective minds and some of the information we were getting coming out of it. Do you think we were vindicated there? And, and also, um, and further to that, 
um, how have you seen this potential, this disconnect between that seems to emerge between the players and the club? Look, I think we were vindicated with um, the stuff that we ran on Collective Minds. I think um, people just simply weren't aware uh, of much of the, the underlying detail associated with that whole fiasco and, and uh, the, the lack of rigour around appointing that organisation. Um, but what's frustrated me over the last probably three or four days is the club's um, um, uh, direction in essentially trying to direct the rhetoric towards um, the players supposedly being unfit or presenting unfit at the beginning of pre-season. Um, and, you know, it depends on which report you read and which comment you, you listen to, with you know, as to how many players it was and whether it was senior players or, or what have you. But the simple fact of the matter is that there's no, there's been no accountability from uh, senior members of the administration, the general manager of football operations, the CEO, um, the head of strength and conditioning, with regards to the roles that they played in messing up our pre-season and essentially derailing our season because of the condition of the playing group, you know, in the first half of the year. Now, Richard Douglas has come out and put his hand up and said, you know, some of the players came back unfit. And to me, that's a fairly frank and honest, um, um, not an assessment, uh, like he's basically put his hand up uh, on behalf of the playing group and said, you know, some of them came back unfit or, or not, not in the best shape. But has Brett Burton come out and said, yes, I messed up with regards to the... Uh, the appointment and and the uh, of collective minds and the camp has Brett Burton come out and said yes I messed up with regards to the implementation of Kangatech. Now people probably Kangatech hasn't really been in the news much, but Kangatech is a load management uh, system. It is a, a a set of tools that is designed specifically to manage the load of players with the with the with the the specified outcome of minimising load-related injuries, and you're talking about hamstrings, you're talking about quads, you're talking about tendonitis, overuse injuries is what the Kangatet tools are there to avoid. Now, North Melbourne have been using Kangatech for a couple of years. They actually developed um, that technology. Uh, Steve Saunders, an Adelaide man who was head of strength and conditioning at North for a, a few years, develop that um, that technology. Um, Adelaide is certainly not the only other club to be using it and Kangatech itself is actually gaining traction globally as, a, as a, a, a good tool in that space. So there's nothing wrong with the technology. So you can only you can only imagine one of three things. Either the strength and conditioning staff were arrogant in terms of ignoring the data that Kangatech was providing to them with regards to the loads that the, the players were carrying, or the strength and conditioning staff were uh, ill-trained or lacked the aptitude to apply the data or the knowledge that Kangatech was giving them, or they simply didn't have the tools available to them to analyse the data appropriately and effectively. Now, I know for a fact that three is a part of it uh, in regards to the tools available to them. Essentially, Kangatech was poorly implemented. It was dropped on them. Um, they didn't have the appropriate tools or aptitude to, um, to use the data. And there was certainly a degree of arrogance there, obviously, because they felt that the players came back in less condition that, than was appropriate. And so they just ramped up, ramped up the program in an already compressed pre-season because of the fact that we went through to the grand final. Um, and we've all seen the results. So has Brett Burton come out and said that he's mismanaged the Kangatech program and that implementation has been poorly handled? No. 
But you know, just to pull you up on something there, Fane, mm. when you say it was dropped on their lap, did Andrew Fagan go out shopping at Kmart and came home with a new program? Like, what does that mean it got dropped in their lap? Like, how could they have not been prepared for it? How could they have not been trained? Like, how can they be so incompetent to drop something like that onto a football club and not be prepared to use it properly? Well, they, they bought the technology, Donkey. So they bought the technology. Now, the technology is essentially a bunch of se- sensors Yep. Um, that is used to collect data and information about um, whatever it's sensing. So it, the, there's foot sensors, there's muscle sensors, there's all sorts of sensors that they can apply. And as a consequence, they can measure um, the condition of that particular area of the body. Now, um, you know, I, I think that Adelaide relied on its existing uh, data management uh, suite of tools uh, to manage the data that was being um, gained from uh, from the Kangatech technology, and I just don't think it was uh, effective. I know it wasn't effective because now they're now they're uh, now they're changing direction on that. Just to, if I just want to add a little bit about the the fact that they're talking about any any sort of review that's going to be done is going to be done internally and it's going to be done by the people that appointed the people that have really stuffed up i mean and there's no doubt that the fitness people didn't get it right maker the review's already been done well the point i'm I'm about to make is this is that firstly i've always thought that andrew fagan was an honest man and yet, I'm reading directly here from an interview that he did with Reese Humphrey in the advertiser. And he said, I don't think there's been one thing in particular this year. There have been a bunch of little things that haven't gone our way. We've had a bunch of injuries, collision-based injuries. We just haven't been able to put the same team on the park. Now, hamstrings are not collision-based in- in- injuries. And that is just straight misleading the public by trying to make that particular statement. So that's the first thing that really disappoints me about Andrew. Then secondly, Andrew is the number one operative in the company. I mean, you have the board, but as far as the organisation goes, he is the number one operative. He is responsible for Burton. Burton reports directly to him. Therefore, if he's saying, I'm going to back him in for next year, and Chapman's saying, I'm going to back what Fagan is doing, who Fagan reports to the board, then quite clearly, if these same guys mess up next year, then Fagan has to go and Chapman has to go, quite clearly, because they are the guys that should be do, making any corrective act, action now, if there is any that should be made. And by saying that we're, gonna, we're going along with these people as they are, then if anything goes bad next year, then I think they have to go quite clearly. So I think they, they, they're gambling with the club and they're gambling with their own futures. And uh, Peter, me, it's, Peter sorry, um, uh, referred to, sorry, Mac, Peter referred to a disconnect and I just wanted to finish my point on that. Sure, yeah. The, the, the fact that um, the club has come out and essentially hung the players out to dry with re- regards to their statements uh, on the condition of the players come in and not... Uh, back that up with some self-admission I I think is driving a a culture of uh, us v them I think it's driving a wedge between the administration and the playing group I don't think it's the the type of thing that you do if you want to um, to have a collaborative working environment uh, no working environment sees unless you're the uh, Liberal Party at the moment uh, sees one group (coughs) or one department throw another department under the bus. You know, uh, you're, it's, you're all in it together. And whether the players came back uh, lacking condition or not, is it's relevant in the, in terms of what happens going forward, but it's, it's not the sort of thing that you put out for public display. The, these guys have, they have one-on-ones with Pikey, they have uh, 360 degree reviews with their peers, they have programs put forward by... Um, by the strength and conditioning team, they have a bunch of feedback and they would have received feedback about the condition that they came back in at the beginning of uh, the season and they would be receiving feedback going forward about how they're expected to come back 
you know, after this uh, pre-season coming up. I don't understand what purpose it serves to actually air that in public, apart from trying to shield other people that have also been complicit in the failure that has been the 2018 season. Um, I, yeah, the only thing I wanted to add to that, um, and thanks for answering my question, Fina. The only thing I wanted to add to that is that just picking up on your point, Macker, about whether it be an external or internal review. I actually, I don't, I don't, I don't mind if it's an inter. <clears throat> sorry, if they implement an internal review, Collingwood um, uh, were a good example of a club who successfully implemented an internal review. But the key to it was is that it was transparent and it was a transparent review that was undertaken by, I think it was Graham Allen um, at Collingwood, um, and it was transparent. And I think that the problem that I have and a problem that I think a lot of people have is that so much of what goes on with the Adelaide Football Club is not transparent. It's nothing to see here. We've got no, there's no, you don't need to know anything. Just buy a membership, turn up and um, just leave it all to us. And there is a, um, a, real, um, a real lack of transparency and um, there has been for many, many years. And I think that whether it be an external review or whether it be somebody um, that was appointed internally who then, um, uh, um, as I said, makes the findings um, or at least some of the findings public, then, you know, um, I, I would be happy with either of those. Yeah, I, I don't disagree, Pete. And I think um, I think it's it's one of those situations where we we remember back to twenty fifteen when when the last upheaval at the club was, and we had Mark Rashudo come in and wield the axe. Uh, Sando left. Um, Phil Walsh came in. We had uh, Andrew Fagan come in as CEO, um, and there were some promises made in 2015 the promises were around uh, best in class football department uh, it was around no spin it was around man conversations it was about transparency and for a while there the club uh, made some tangible changes and i think it's a fair indicator of where the club was prior to that that those changes were so noticeable it was a very different club that we were that, that that we were following in 2015, and it gave a lot of supporters um, a bit of hope that perhaps the club had entered a new phase of professionalism and accountability. Now, you know, notwithstanding the obvious tragedy that happened in 2015, the simple fact of the matter is, the club has not been true to those stated goals in 2015. We've returned to uh, spin, we've returned to a lack of transparency, and I would challenge anyone at the club, from Mark Rusciuto all the way down, to define what best in class is in terms of a football department, and try to correlate that with the football department that we currently have, because I'm not seeing it, and the results don't show it. I think you, you can't argue with that particular comment. Um... Oh, there's a drink. Sorry? <laughs> on Twitter during the week, Joel Constable put up a fantastic tweet about the Macca drinking game. And uh, there's certain mm, phrases yeah, that you say good. quite regularly, Macca, and that's one of them. <laughs> and every time oh. you say them, they've got to take a drink. So people on Twitter, take a drink. <laughs> uh, be, be careful, Jed, but you mind out uh, getting pissed by the end of the night. Oh, so. I think they're probably pissed already. <laughs> couldn't, well, couldn't agree more. I also want to say something <laughs> that – address something that um, – Brent said on the on the speaker chat, uh, and Brent's talking about uh, you know people make mistakes and and all the rest of it, and I I accept that I, I accept that people make mistakes, um, but it ties back into something that Mac has been going on about for the last couple of weeks, and people who had the pleasure of listening to Mac's um, explosion on last Tuesday night live will recall vividly the fact that uh, Macca's big beef was the fact that the right bums aren't on the right seats. And you minimise the mistakes made by people in, in those positions if you actually appoint the right people. Now, it's little wonder that Brett Burton has made so many mistakes, given the fact that he has zero qualifications, as Macca's rightly pointed out repeatedly, um, in 
in the space that is currently operating in. So, you know, I guess you're getting we're getting what we paid for with regards to Brett Burton. But to absolve people by saying people make mistakes, the 20, I think Brent was re- referring to the 2017 season where, you know, we didn't have these issues. We actually did have a run of soft tissue injuries in 2017, quite early on in the season, if people will recall. And the 2016 season, when um, Matt Haas came on board and Brett Burton came on board, they were enjoying the uh, the fruits of Nick Poulos' uh, work from previous seasons. So really, 2017, there was red flags about soft tissue, and 2018, um, we've seen what's happened, and that's all on Brett Burton and Matt Haas, in my opinion. Yeah, well, look, I still say stick to what I'm saying. Having appointed heaps and heaps of people in my in in my life, I've always made sure that they are suitable for the job. And in my opinion, I don't believe Burton is suitable for the job because, I mean, he hasn't got any experience in so many areas of the job that he's responsible for. For example, like list management, the list, they report to Burton, the people that. Uh, drafting, recruiting, all those things report to him and he's got no background in that at all. And his background is basically fitness and they've made a nice mess of that. And uh, then he's also got to occasionally go on uh, TV and do an interview and if you saw that famous 3pm one on the Saturday, I mean, seriously, he looked like a person who could only dog paddle trying to swim the English Channel. He was that incompetent. I mean, he's just not the right person for the job. I'm just going to butt in and say, Pete, watch your cord, mate, because it's rattling away there. And I, and I was also just going to butt in and say, we've probably got all of that off of our chest, I think, probably, for, yeah. the, for half an hour. Should we, should, we, should we switch topics? Yeah, look, I think so. I mean, you know... The, it, it's, it's important stuff, and I think there's no doubt, but um, we probably just want to... I'd really like to have a chat about the upcoming trade period, the uh, trade and, and draft period, and... I'm not sure that there's much to talk about at the North game. <laughs> Did anyone have much exciting to say about the North Melbourne game? Well, I was at the match and it was pretty dead. Well, I mean, let's move until, on. Until the last minute. And a cracker coming up this Saturday night too. Oh, yeah, let's talk about that. Well, let's move on to the, to the, um, to the match talks, shall we? Because there is a bit to discuss. I think the main point to discuss about the North game is the bloody selection. Oh yeah, just I was so, I mean, I was messaging you, Fiend, and I was just so upset that uh, the big, uh, the big easy Elliot Himmelberg couldn't get a run. I just mm. uh, particularly once Alex Keith pulled out, I just could not understand that for the life of me. And that's yeah, you know, full credit to Andy Otten who played a great game. Great game. Can't uh, yeah. can't deny him that. And good on him, and you know you, you, you could possibly say that just in terms of the actual match itself, um, that the selectors were vindicated um, because he came in, he played an excellent game. Um, but just in terms of you know where we were with the actual game itself and what it meant, and the opportunities that were there to to give someone like Himmelberg a run, I just uh, I, I just couldn't understand it. Well, you know, I, I'm 100 percent in uh, in support of that. Is that another one? Was that another drink for the boys or not? <laughs> but, I think uh, it's couldn't agree more. Okay. Yeah, something like that. Um, well, I just, I just varied it. I just see, see, see if they have a drink for that or not. Um, we're spot on. We're spot on, one of them. You're spot on there. Yeah, you're spot on. You can't argue with have that. Another, we'll have another <laughs> drink, <laughs> boys. Go and have another drink. <laughs> uh, Oh, wow. I've even forgot what the bloody I forgot what the topic was now. <laughs> Just selection. <laughs> selection. No, oh yeah. No, look, I was I was a big G for Himmelberg getting a game as well because uh he's he's gonna be the uh <laughs> this is stole my line. Um, he's uh, uh he's definitely gonna be a, a part of the future of the club. And uh uh from all reports from um people who do go to the SAFL and watch him all the time, they, they are really giving him raps and saying that in long term he's going to be very, very good. And this would have been an excellent game to play him in, in a game that it wouldn't have really mattered if he hadn't have performed very, very greatly or not. Because, no. it just, it would have, because you know, there was nothing hanging on the end of the game. So it would have been just an excellent game to give him that opportunity to get the feel of what's necessary to play at that level. And I just think that we did miss an, an opportunity. 
What do you reckon, Don? What do you reckon, Don? Oh, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, <laughs> no, to be honest, it was I was uh, I was actually quite disappointed, and it was completely unimagin- unimaginative selection. You know, I think there was opportunity for a few blokes to have a look at over the weekend. Um, the game was a, a dead rubber. In fact, it was more problematic for us if we if we'd won uh, in terms of where we're going to finish up draft order. So it was just a very um, a very strange watching of the game. I was excited with a Crows win, and you know it's always excellent. But um, I just felt that you know the fact that Berg didn't get a run after talking him up all week, um, it just it was just one of those ones where you just it was just a you just weren't emotionally invested in it. This is what the club's done to us. Well, I mean, I guess you know this this one's on selection because. Um, I just don't understand what the point was in in. I mean, a lot of people saying, "Oh, you know, you can't go out there to lose and all the rest of it." I, I don't think anyone on this podcast is asking the team to go out to lose, but I think the coaching staff and the football department in general have have an obligation to put a team on the park that uh, serves the club best. And and you know, to my way of thinking, what served the club best for for last week and this week is to have a look at juniors and to put some players out to pasture that need a rest, you know. I mean... And let, we... Let's be clear here, Fane. Mm. Let's be very clear here. We're not talking about, and I know that some people have pulled me up on this, saying, well, you know, you're gifting games. And I, I just want to make very clear that we're not talking about gifting games here. We're talking about a young kid who has performed really solidly in the SNFL this year and he's built his game. He started to spend time in the ruck. And, you know, he's only two or three weeks from having kicked a bag of five goals and he's followed that up with good, you know, with good solid form. So we're not talking about just giving a game for the sake of it. We've got someone who's, you know, been performing solidly in this NFL for pretty much most of the year. Yeah, definitely. And not only that, Pete, but the, the, the whole notion of gifting games is ridiculous because if you want to develop players... You have to be prepared to give them a, a game or two. Jordan Gallucci has is, is, uh, been selected at times when he ha- his form hasn't warranted it. Uh, mm. Lachlan Murphy's been selected at times when his form hasn't warranted it. We have players that, uh, for the sake of development, I mean, we've played Wayne Miller uh, plenty of times, not so much this season, but certainly last season, when his form didn't warrant it. You... you you always select with an eye to the future. And if you've got a, a, a young player who shows some talent and shows some signs and you've got a spot there where, the, where he can be useful and gain some experience in the AFL, then you play him, and particularly in a, in a dead rubber situation. And we all know that if Tex hadn't been suspended, he would have played. And yet, mm-hmm. as a consequence of not playing, he was able to go in for surgery this week. Now, I don't understand why that wouldn't have happened regardless. But we all know that it wouldn't have happened had he not been suspended. We've got Daniel Talia now, who's actually trying to get himself right to play this week. Now, I don't... Under, Daniel Talia has been carrying fractures and knees and all sorts of bloody things. Give the poor bloke a rest. We don't even have a match-up for two tools against Carlton. Why, why are we bothering with Daniel Talia this week? Uh, I this This is on selection... And this is where I get so disheartened because I just I just don't understand the direction that the club is taking. And no one from the club seems to even be prepared to make a statement on that basis. The only thing I could think of with Himmelberg was that um, <clears throat> whether he was... Um whether he, he is under some program of management in terms of his body and they're just not prepared to and put his body out into an AFL environment as yet, which I can understand. He's a big lump of a lad. He's 200 centimetres, but he's still only just turned 20 years of age. He's still very, very young, and his body would still be quite raw. Yeah. So uh, well, if that was the case, then, you know, I, I would, yeah, well, he's a different kettle of fish, Fane. He's a, you know, he's a he's a, he's a monster yeah, uh, he's already. Um, so I think that their bodies are probably different. But... Uh, we played Wayne Miller be, last year when answer. he was 19 and a twig. Yeah, look, it may not be the answer. I'm just looking for potential, yeah. I guess, right. potential ex- you know, excuses. And, um, and it's probably a bit thin. 
Um, there's probably, you know, the, I mean, Himmelberg's been, you know, playing key forward and, and ruck in the SNFL for all year. So he's been playing against men. So it's probably probably a, um, a fallacious argument, but um, I, I'm just, I just can't, I can't, I can't see, you know, any reason why they wouldn't have taken the opportunity. No, I don't Look, understand. One, one thing I'm just taking going forward to next year, which is interesting to me, um, if the scribes are right that Hibbelberg's going to be ready next year to play at AFL level, um, and we've, we've got Walker who's uh, had his operation now and he should come back next year and play a lot better than he did this year because it's obvious that he laboured all year with injury. Um, you've got Jenkins at full forward, you've got Walker at set half forward or the other way around, whichever way they go. Um, and then you've got young Fogarty and you've got young... Yeah, Himmelberg, and they play and young Lacocious. The uh, well, hopefully that would be very good too. Hmm. Um, where do where do you fit all these guys? Well, Himmelberg's not going to be ready for a full season next year. They, they will, I imagine, ease him in. Um, so he's not going to play a full year next year. He'll just play. Um, hopefully, he'll play a few games here or there. But um, it's a good question. But the, you know, the, Walker and Jenkins are you know they're they're getting on. And um, you, you, you know, really at the moment, if um, if our season was still alive, and um, you know those guys go down, then we don't have a lot of backup in terms of um, key position forwards. At the moment, we don't. But the next year, um, if those blokes uh, they do come along as we would hope they come along, it could be a bit of a, a log jam for positions. I reckon it's. I reckon both Fogarty and Hillberg are still a couple of years away from playing regular AFL football. Well, yeah, you, Fogarty, in, right. Fogarty in particular, I think. Yeah. I thought Fogarty, not going to be ready. For an 18 year old lad, though, I thought Fogarty never ever had he, he never disgraced himself in any game that he played. He showed flashes, Macca, but he couldn't sustain any kind of influence on the game at all. No, certainly not. And, and, that, and that's not a criticism. I mean, you know, he's an 18 year old who was thrust into a a key position role um, where he probably shouldn't have been. But I think that in terms of his fitness and his work rate and all of those things, he's going to be, I would say, a 2020, and the same as Himmelberg. But 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 I would imagine they'll both play some games next year. But I don't think that's going to be an issue until at least 2020. So next uh, next year you're really looking at at, a, at at the same sort of Walker, Walker, Lynch, uh, <clears throat> Jenkins construct, I think, depending on whether McGovern comes or uh, goes or stays. Um, so that's going to, I don't think that's going to change too much next year. Just so I think the, 2020 is the year. Just a McGovern, Pete, now that you mentioned him, do you think mm-hmm. that the Adelaide Football Club will be tempted to your, try and use him as a piece to uh, try and get hold of a the number one pick off a of Carlton? I don't think that they would want him to leave. I don't think that they would. I don't think he's contracted, and I certainly don't think they'll be sitting down and saying, we want you to go so we can... Um, I, I think it's going to be a case of whether he wants to go and whether he, because, um, I mean, we, we went through this earlier in the year. We we uh, stuck out, stuck it, well, I certainly stuck my neck out to get it chopped off, um, to, to drop a, some information that I had about the McGovern uh, situation, and I haven't heard anything different. So I'm going to assume that that's still the case. Um, so whether he, whether it transpires that he wants to go, that, that'll be the question, uh, whether he wa- he actually wants to go and where he wants to go. Um, there's rumours abound of him wanting to go to potentially going to Carlton, and there's always a, a sniff of about Fremantle. Although interestingly, um, his brother's obviously signed with the West Coast, so that's there's no sort of romance of coming together, you know, to play for Dad's team. Um, so I, you know, whether Carlton are really genuinely are in the frame, um, and if they are, well, then that will be um, that will provide great interest, and I think. And obviously, Seedsman's the other one, um, with uh, you know being sought after by St Kilda, and so they're two, I think, you know, very um, tradable um, players if we have to, um, and um, could get us a you know a really really strong draft position in what is a critical draft for this club. Um, is the coach just... as good as good as the, the, they say he is? Ah, oh, we've already had that discussion, Macker. He is. Simple as that. Okay. Um, just I'd rather for, Rankin. 
just for for uh, just butting in on some no, non news related stuff, I've just posted on the Facebook live feed the Macca's drinking game. Um, so just uh, someone on Facebook chat asked me for the rules. So Macca, if you say that's true, that's a sip. Um, if you say Eddie has the yips, that's a shot. If you say can't argue with that, that's a sip. If you say uh, um, that's a shot. If you say totally agree, that's a sip. And if you call Bert a dickhead. Everyone's got a skull, so well, that's it. I'll be very, dis- I'm very disappointed if we haven't got a bunch of alcoholics out there with lying flat on their backs <laughs> by the end of the day. Look, I'd be going for ranking ahead of Luco. We've we've had this discussion before. I think Luco's a gun, but in terms of what we need, uh, and as you rightly point out, Macca, we've got a dearth of forwards at the uh, sorry, a, a plethora of forwards at the moment, um, and we probably need some pace. So. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd be letting Luco develop at Carlton, ready for us to pick him back up after his first contract. Yeah, get him as a Cat C rookie. Yeah, but that, that you know as well as I do, that never happens. They get to Melbourne and they stay. They, they very rarely come back. And I think that um, I don't think we've got a plethora of um, if you if you if you're projecting past Walker Jenkins Lynch, I don't. You know, you really you you got Himmelberg. And Fogarty, and that's it. McGovern. Um, Deer hasn't come on. He'll he'll go. McGovern. Well, I, well, that's you know, does does he go or does he stay? Well, I mean, we we can only talk on the basis that he's staying. He's got two. If years we lose McGovern, J- JJ is only twenty seven, so you don't have to project past Jenkins just yet. Um, we've also got Ben Davis. Isn't, I thought he's older than. Isn't he older than seven? Um, he's under thirty. He's older than twenty seven. Might be twenty nine. I think mean, he's thirty. I reckon oh. Jenkins will be 30 at the start of next year. Mm, maybe. Um, ben Davis is also there. So you've got a replacement for Lynch, you've got a replacement for Jenkins, you've got a replacement for Walker, and you've got a replacement for um, uh, someone else. Who's Ben Davis? Ben Davis doesn't play anything like Tom Lynch. Oh, it, that's, I he's a mid size. Uh, ben Davis is a, a mid size forward. You, what, what you're looking at, what, what you want is, is, is your forward set up to be, you know, Himmelberg takes a Jenkins position. Fogarty takes the Walker role, and then you've got um, you know Lacocious kind of taking the the Lynch role because Lacocious can play all over the ground. But do you want to pay a first round draft pick pick for a link up forward? Oh, well, as I said, he can play all over the field, and so maybe he play. I'm and I'm just you know I'm just putting in like for like. Obviously, yeah, yeah, he can, yeah. you know he can play key forward, he can play back, he can play on a wing, he can play all over the place. He's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, oh, look, I, I'm with you. Don't don't worry about that. I'm, I'm and I with think you. Rank, I don't think Rankin will go top five. I think he'll. Sl- I think he'll slide down. I think he's got a few issues. Mm. He's he's also the one that's more likely to come home out of the two because he's he, he keeps constantly saying he'd love to play. That's a good road. point, Macca. That's a good point. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I, I don't think. I, I mean, there's enough uh, Victorian talent um, in the top half a dozen. For Rankin to slip, I think. Uh, I think Rankin's the one that will get to us, assuming that we stay where we are in, in the draft uh, lineup. I mean, I, look, I was a, I was a massive G to get Luco earlier in the year, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought we need pace, and and that's why I'd probably pass. Um, but I don't think he gets to us anyway. Oh, I think I think if he's there when you get to pick, you take him. But I don't think you bust your ass to get it to pick high enough to. Or you don't sell the farm to get that one pick. Like you don't use all your assets. We've got a lot of assets to play with at this trade period. We've got, we've got our pick. We've got uh, Melbourne's pick. Uh, we've got Carlton second, and we've got the 2019 first as well to all throw in a in a package. So, um, uh, and if you know Seesman and and McGovern do want out, or they are you know possible trade partners, I think I think we can do stuff to get both of them. I think there's actually enough in play, but um, it, I just don't. I just think. You, you need at least two you, uh, two guns out of it. You don't you can't just bottle it all up for one. That's probably what I'm thinking. Yeah, it's not a bad point, Don. Yep. Um any more on the North game? I uh, I mean it was a Oh sorry, I look I went to the game. I don't know if I went I went to the game. Um it um zero atmosphere at the start. It did got a, it got a little bit exciting when North obviously got to within a few points. Um and um, it looked like we could lose the game. We woke up in the last five minutes. And, of course, uh, Eddie takes the mark on the siren. That brings the house down. So there was some significant atmosphere at the end. 
but certainly for the first three quarters it was um you know really twiddle your thumbs kind of stuff and it was um not a great i didn't think it was a great standard of game i don't know what you guys thought but uh, it was just it just looked like two teams that uh, weren't going to make the eight well certainly the lack of atmosphere came through on the tv i don't know about you guys but it was pretty palpable from from listening on the telly I, it, it, I thought it was going to be a nil or draw. You know, you felt like you were watching a boring soccer match halfway through that first and second quarter. Like, mm. it was just, the skills were atrocious. It was just, it was like poor keepy off. It was actually just really bad footy. And um, I, you just, you just, it was just weird to watch yeah. in the first half. Yeah, very strange. Okay. And I just, being, being in the Western State, maybe, you know, you, you know, you have to get there a bloody hour before the gate so open to get a decent seat. Blah 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 blah, and we had stuff on, and we were sort of panicking, thinking, "Oh, we're not going to get there until only half an hour before the game." And I suddenly stopped and I thought, "You know what? North Melbourne, four o'clock on a Sunday, last game of the year. It's going to be all right. right. We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> it's going to be fine." And sure enough, we got there at quarter. We got there at quarter to four, and um, just strolled straight into into three seats. Um, right, you know, where we would normally sit and where I'd have to queue. So, yeah, that just, and I just, I don't know, that just sort of said to me that, no, nah, <laughs> this is no big deal, this game. Yeah, Let's just good. get it done and get it over with. Hope for no injuries. And, of course, unfortunately, Tom Dede got himself a broken oh, collarbone, yeah. which is most unfortunate, but uh, was, that's the way it goes. Was the crowd as quiet as it sounded on the television? Yeah, they were. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't Absolutely. think there was 41,000 no there. Atmosphere. Other said that on the chat. There was uh, zero atmosphere. And, I, yeah, I'm very surprised at the 40,000 number. I thought we'd dip under 40. Um, there were gaps everywhere. And, um, yeah, the, look, there was until, the, as I said, until that last five minutes when it looked like we could lose the game and Eddie takes the screamer, there was zero atmosphere. Yeah. A um, couple of highlights, I thought. I thought Jordan Galicia was fantastic. Um, yeah, I thought I he was, took thought a couple it was of great a, marks, didn't he? Yeah, oh, and took some very hard hits as well, Pete. Like he put his mm, body on the mm. line, and uh, one hit from Zebo in particular, uh, he really stayed in the contest. Yeah. And um, yep, saw that. I, I thought it was an excellent game from the Gooch. Uh, he had twenty-two disposals, which I think is probably is a career high for him. Um, you know, and just just looked a part of it. He he really looked like uh, he'd a be lot. A part you know what? I like him a lot, Fino. I reckon he's got a real lot to offer. I, I really do. His his vertical leap is incredible. If he's yeah. at ground level, when you see a ball that you're sure is going to clear him, and his vertical leap is unbelievable. But he's just, um, you know, what I really like about him is he, he's a kicker. Yeah, yeah. You, you'll always see a very, very significant. Um, he'll always err on the side of kicking. Yeah. Um, and I just think that, um, you know, we've got some. We've got, you know. One or two very very happy handballers in our team, and I think having a, a kicker is a good balance to the midfield. Um, he just adds a lot, I think. He just, I don't know, he's quite, he's just athletic and he's quick and he, um, he kind of looks a bit ungainly at times. But gee, he's a bloody effective footballer, Gooch. I, I like him a lot. Well, I yeah. think next year will be a very good year for him and uh, getting. I thought this was his real breakout game uh, where he, I, I thought he played a complete game and, and in, in all aspects of the game. And uh, uh, I think he'll add something in the midfield next year in terms of pace as well. I think uh, I, everything you said is true about the fact that you know the, um, that he does like to kick the ball, and he's a and he's very good kick with either foot. So uh, yeah, I think I think that when they drafted this boy, they they did draft a good one. Yep, absolutely. some of his some of his foot passing has been. Outstanding. It wasn't a surprise. I do, I do remember seeing him at North, at the parade um, uh, last year, and he only got eight or nine disposals on the day. But there was a, just a, a point in time where he broke through the centre and he laced out a kick, just an absolute you know burner of a kick. Um, it was flat and it was hard, and it just um, hit. I can't even remember who it was now, but it hit a leading forward on the chest, and I just thought, Jesus, that's some some impressive disposal. Yeah, um, he can dispose of the ball very well. Well, let, let, I mean, we need a couple of kickers in our midfield because I, I'm interested in your thoughts, um, Pete and Donkey, because Macker and I had a bit of a blue on Sunday about Matty Crouch. Um, what do you have? Uh, two kicks and about 20 handballs to half time. Um, and a lot of people were talking very positively about Matt's game, and 
I, I thought for all the ball that he got, a lot of it was wasted. But, but that is Matt Crouch, and and you know I've always form, said, Pete. I've always said that the Crouches obviously had a very very small backyard when they grew up because um, <laughs> neither of them they they they're both as humble happy as each other, and um, their their numbers are always out of kilter. Um, in terms of their um, um, the ratio of handball kicks, and um, they do they do handball a lot, yeah, and you know even when he's 20. playing well, Fane, he does he is an absolute handball, you know, and a lot of it's not constructive. I, I just think that with Matt Crouch, he, you know, he, he just racks up so much of the ball. I always think I, my rule of thumb is always to deduct about you know ten or twenty percent of his possession total to see what's really effective. Mm. Look, uh, uh, you, you, you can't argue with that because of the fact that um, otherwise we'd be, we would have dominated a lot more. But I, I did like the way that Gibbs was set up on uh, the, uh, facing towards our goal side and uh, uh, Matty Crouch positioned himself at the front of the packs and when he got the ball, he ought just immediately just turned around and fired it out to Gibbs when he was there, which gave Gibbs mm. the opportunity then to use the ball. And I thought that... Uh, so some of these handball was very, very good. Um, there are other times I do agree uh, with Phoenix that they uh, he will handball unnecessary, but perhaps he could have kicked the ball. Um, and some of those yeah. over-the-head handballs to nowhere, that, that's just like... That's an unwillingness to take the tackle. Um, mm. And he, he sold a few of our guys into trouble a couple of times by doing that, particularly in the last quarter under a bit of pressure. Um, he did it a couple of times and uh, led to turnovers, and that, that's not what you want to see from your elite midfielder because that's panic. But yeah. I, st- I still think, given, given all those uh, criticisms as well, he was still uh, very close, if not our best player. No, near look, it. he always ends up in the coaches' <laughs> votes, and and I, I, I've seen games where I didn't think he was as as effective as what you'd like, and yet he ends up in the coaches' votes. They obviously appreciate him. And um, I just, I do think sometimes, though, with Matt Crouch and sometimes even um, uh, Rory Laird, I, I think sometimes we, do, we can get a little bit carried away with just look, focusing solely on the amount of ball that they get. Um, you know, Laird with his little 30 metre loopers up the wing, yeah. you know, he does, it, he does a lot of those and runs around in a circle a lot with little handballs. And, and they, you know, between the two of them, it's what you know. It, I mean, it, fascinating, fascinating contest. If you're betting on most possessions, and and you go group one, and you always got Laird and Matt Crouch as to who's going to win that battle. But uh, you always know it's going to be one of the two. But I, I do, you know, and I'm not going to criticise because they've been terrific players for our club the last couple of years. And so, and you know, they're both all Australians. And so, far be it from me um, to criticise two players who have been outstanding. But I do sometimes think. That you know their their possession, the weight of possession can sometimes mask what they're actually doing. Yeah, I think I, I think that Matt Crouch. I don't think he's. I don't think we've seen him at one hundred percent very much this year. And I think I just think he doesn't. I think he looks like a player just a little bit down on his confidence. And um, what he hadn't been doing four or five weeks ago was even racking up the possessions. Now he's at least getting the chill. We just yeah. need to get him to start using it yeah, a bit no, better. Cool. Yeah, um, good call. Um, so I think. Yeah, I think there's a bit of that, and I and I wonder if um if either his leg's still a bit tight and he just doesn't think he's got that much pace and you know for that extra step to get foot on the ball. But um um yeah I'm not, I, I'm I'm not, probably not as um as and I listened to you guys the other night um but I'm probably not as um as dark on Matt Crouch and his effectiveness as you are, Fiend. But I'm also you know I think he could be a lot better. Yeah, uh, two and twenty is is too much of a disparity in my opinion, and I think it was addressed in the second in, at half time because his his numbers balanced out a little bit better in the second half. Um, and uh, you're right, Pete. He does always he is handball happy, but when he is on song, he does tend to look for the kick a little bit more. Uh, but more, I think, he tends to have an uh, an extra moment with ball in hand when he's in good nick, Pete. Uh, so even though he does have that weight against handballs, his handballs, I think, are more decisive uh, when he's in form. Uh, and we don't see a lot of that panic stuff or that hot potato type of stuff that we sometimes get from Matt when he's just lacking a bit of touch. And uh, I think he's looking for the finishing line too, to be honest. He's had a tough year. Who, um, who do we get, reckon gets the gold jacket this year? 
God. I reckon it's Bryce Gibbs. Hmm. Well, how, many games, how many games did Crouch Lady miss? Close. And how many games Cr- did Laird miss? Laird Cr- miss? Crouch missed a lot and Laird missed a couple, but Laird's actually had his possession countdown over the last six weeks as well. So um, I think I think Bryce has just been there and, and mowing along for the whole time. Yeah, I think that those three, I think Matt Crouch, Laird and Gibbs, will, it'll, be, it'll be from one of those three. Yeah, um, you'd have to think so. I wouldn't mind betting Tom today a bit of a smoky. He may not win it, but I reckon Ooh. he'll be the highest ranked rookie in our BNF we've ever had. He's had such a solid season. And yes. deservedly so he is too. But it might yeah. end up being a couple of weeks out that does him in in the end because I think he'll rate very highly. Um, I can't think of anyone up forward. Um, JJ, I think, has had a really good year. Um, yep. And I think he'll figure, you know, he's hit the 40-goal mark and, and and he's come on in leaps and bounds in terms of his desire and ability to take uh, contact and contest. So full marks to him. I think he'll figure highly. I think Gibbs, you're right. Um, uh, Donk, I think he'll figure highly. I think Miller will probably poll pretty well. Um, but, uh, yeah, aside from that, I mean... I. Maybe Laird, uh, but I think you're right. A lot of his possessions, Pete, are a bit meh, and he can also he is a bit guilty also of panic under under severe pressure. Um, but he has been rock solid for us, and it had, for large periods of the season, particularly before the break, he was a bit of a a, um, a lone hand in our defence down down back there. So mm. uh, he'd, he'd probably be a, lo- uh, a worthy winner. I reckon it's going to be very hard to tell because, you know, the guys that you would expect would have won it, miss, miss games. Um, I don't know whether Gibbs uh, was, and the point was made by PJ Crows that Gibbs was flat mid season. He did have a, a patch in the middle of the year where probably three or four games, maybe, maybe a bit more that while he was okay, he certainly wouldn't be a, a vote getter in that particular period. So I, 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 I think it's a pretty open one. Mm. Oh, now we've got a game coming up on the weekend. Have we? Yeah. Nah, I think I think there's an open training session at Eddie Adams Saturday <laughs> afternoon. <laughs> Carlton v the Crows Saturday night, seven twenty-five at Eddie Had. Do we think we're going to get the same selection? Um, we, pr- we well, probably they'll, will. They've got to replace D Day, don't they? Yeah, so someone's going to come in for for dude. Uh, Fogarty's been playing in a defensive capacity. It'll be interesting to see if they bring him in in that role because we don't have too many defenders left um, down there. Oh, we got I, Ch- Kelly came McGovern. in as a late replacement. McGovern should go back. Yeah, we well he may have to um, Macca because we don't. I, I can't think of anyone uh, that could come in for dude. Kelly and Cheney are already in the 22. Yeah. We're running out. Uh, running yeah. out. Mm. And we've only got one McKay, not 45. Will I mean, Keith it, be back, do you think? Oh, I don't know. What What was he out for? Was It, it was hamstring, wasn't it, that he was out for? Hammy. So he won't be, he won't be <coughs> back. Hammy, yeah. No, he won't be back. Tali's the only a five. If Tali comes back, then obviously that pushes a... a a secondary across, so that might be a. I don't know. Maybe McGovern does go back, or maybe they bring Fogarty in for today. Um, surely, I, surely, the big the big Berg a, a run. No, he against Carton on the MCG wouldn't ex, wouldn't experience that. Be the MCG, plenty of ball coming into the fifty. Had. It's Eddie. Had. Oh, Eddie had is it? Yeah, plenty of ball coming into the fifty. I mean, seriously. No, can't surely see it. Can't see it. Why would they? I. I, I think that Pete is right from the desire for wanting to have that happen. Oh, yeah. But but I have had the life sucked out of me the last two <laughs> weeks with this club and, uh, and I'm with Pete and the, uh, there's no chance that they'll do anything that could have possibly make us a little bit better next year. I reckon it would be almost a piss take if they bloody selected Himmelberg this week. Yeah, they got, I think if they're going to pick him, it should have been last week. Yeah. Although the only thing, the only thing is, I'm thinking just the way our club, you know, bums on seats mentality is that you point out, thing, is they just wanted to have that, 
you know, that last week was our last round, you know, that was our last home game. We're putting the show on, you know, made everything happen. And, uh, and this week we'll box everyone up and give someone a run. I reckon they might've got 42,000 if they'd played the Berg. Might've drawn in an extra thousand people. Is it going to anyway. be family? <laughs> Oh, look, I don't know. I I mean, who cares about this Carlton game? We just don't want any injuries. Um, I don't think much will change with the selection. They showed their hand last week. I was horrified. I think we were all pretty horrified with the selection last week. I don't see any reason why they'll change it. They'll just coast out the season and uh, and then we can look forward to trade period and uh, see what uh, conservative moves can happen then. Hopefully they'll rush Smith back after his caught calf or something. <laughs> Yeah, uh, 12 months oh. out with an ACL, he does a calf and we'll rush him back in after one. I, yeah, hope I, reckon. That, I, I genuinely hope they don't pick Smith. Yeah, yeah you just wait. <laughs> so I, I guess the ultimate irony would be if we handed Carlton a victory. Uh, anyone see that happening? I don't think it's possible. I think Carlton are just the, well, like, they're not, they're, they're, they're VFL B grade at the moment. Oh, they are. They've they've really fallen off the perch. Oh, Although no. Paddy Cripps would be going for three votes, I reckon. I think the only way that Carl could win it is if we forfeit. Like, look, if they actually, if we actually go and run the oval, they can't win. Yeah, I, I don't see it. I don't see it. They're no, they're no good. No. Anyway, let's get in, let's get on to something a bit more interesting, shall we? Because uh, there's a bit going on in this space. In this space, it's <laughs> <laughs> my music. Donkey. Yes, that's right, sports fans. Welcome back to the final preliminary grand final. Something edition. Hang, hang on, the- hang on a sec, Donkey. I'm sorry, you had such momentum going there, but Pete, if you don't shut your cable off. I'm going to actually kick you out because <laughs> it's driving me crazy. How can you interrupt that intro? I'm going to have to go again. <laughs> it's Pete's Sorry, fault. Mate. Pete's fault. All right, go again. Grumpy. And go. Welcome back to the grand final edition of Crowcast Dream Team. We've got a massive round coming up. We've got Peanut the Winter March coming in against Dylan FCC. I think it's uh, going to be a very exciting game for everybody watching as the scores tick over over the weekend. There's not very many difference between the two sides. Uh, the Peanut starts off with Heppel, Menegola, Martin, Dunkley, Neil and Hearn. This is Uniques. Westhoff, Merritt, Hurley, Dangerfield, Ablett and Mundy. For Dylan FCC, I reckon Dylan's going to get done like a, a two dollar, a ten dollar dinner. Um, <laughs> well, you're faltering, mate. Come on, come on, bring I it just home. Wasn't sure, this is a, this is still a family show, so I didn't want to get too so far in. The so other after thing, peanuts. Oh, okay. They're going to get done like two dollar hookers. <laughs> then we're going to fly over to the sports deck. Uh, tubing competition. Oh, Jay Mack out in Hang front on. with a Jeez. four point lead. What? Keep going. J Mac out with a four point lead over Dominic uh, on 129. B short on 129 as well. Settler Dwellers at 128. Uh, Mark on 128. And Moyley falling right away also on 128. He's going to have to pull back five here to even equal up with J Mac. I reckon Moyley's done. Uh, J Mac, I reckon you've got the chocolates this year. Uh, down to the Crowcast end of the car, of the uh, tipping ladder. Uh, Donkey Magoo still holding that two-point lead <laughs> week after week over Peter J and Phoenix. Again, we all got five for the week. Fantastic tripping, fellas. We are in sync. Uh, we are so in sync. We have not missed a beat for about eight, nine weeks now. Uh, it's really exciting stuff. Who's going to take out the Crowcast ladder? I reckon J Max got the footy coming his way. And that is the end of the sports report. Go back to you, the sports desk, Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> See, this was actually the week you could have taken a bit of time because it's the grand final of the dream. It's the grand final of the dream team. It's not just any well, old week. It's the GF. I don't think it. I don't think it's going to bore the crap out of people any more or less that aren't listening. Right. <laughs> I, I want to point out that that one of the semis last week was really close. It was only like seven points in it. Barachos oh, okay. against well, Dylan's. Well, no, that's, I'm happy to. I'm happy to talk about it. Oh, it's too late. You're now, the one that yells at me. They don't don't encourage him, Fane. Come on. Well, the other thing I need to mention too is that uh, we did point out uh, during the week on Twitter that uh, the Adelaide Footy Club have kindly donated a couple of uh, footies, 
uh, good uh, Sharon's uh, signed by Tex and Don Pike. So one of those footies will be going to the winner of the Dream Team competition. So either uh, Dylan or the Winter March will be getting a footy coming their way. And also uh, the winner of the tipping competition will have a footy coming their way too. And that looks like being J-Mac at the moment, although he just wavered just a little bit last week. I think he's feeling the pressure coming into the final round. He is a little bit in front. But uh, you never yeah, know, look, stranger things have happened. Yeah, look, he's got to drop four games. It's going to be very hard to do from here. He's going to have to, um, he's, he, he, even if he didn't tip, if he just forgot to do it, I reckon he'd still get over the line. So um, I reckon he's fine. Um, just a bit of a, just put a little couple of tickets on myself. Um, uh, in in, a, in the uh, Adelaide Crows, big footy, uh, uh, what's the other one I'm in? Um, Super coach, uh, I am in the grand final of Div One, um, up against the Terra Squad. So hopefully, uh, hopefully I get the take home a banner, and plus I get a little special badge on the side of my profile. It's actually, it's actually what I play it for. So happy days. Very good, mate. I'm proud, <laughs> proud of you. That's nice. Thank you. <laughs> With uh, my father gone, it's just nice having someone like you that is around like that as a figure in my life. Well, I guess uh, without any further ado, then we should lead into Game of Crows. <laughs> Right, well, it was last week, it was time on ground, and only one person scored any sort of point at all, uh, picking JJ. Uh, I think that, who was that? I think that might have been Joel Constable, who's a bit of a dark horse because Joel's a prior winner and he's just snuck up the, the uh, leaderboard somewhat um, over the past couple of weeks. So uh, we need to watch Joel. Now, look, I've got to say that Game of Crows has been a dog, dog's breakfast. I've admitted that. Um, but... Right now, I think it's time that we straighten things up. What I've actually done with Game of Crows is that I've done two things. First of all, I've awarded a participation bonus to everyone who's ever put in a nomination for a round of um, Game of Crows. So what that's done is award 10 points for every round that you actually entered in uh, the competition. So uh, that's given... A few people, a bit of a, um, a bit of credit, I think, just for uh, participating every week, and it's taken away some of the disparity for people who might have chucked in one or two weeks worth of, uh, worth of, um, sorry, one one or two weeks worth of uh, entries, and then, you know, shut up. Basically, there's more people in this competition, you know, and then just dropped away. <laughs> All right, you guys are muted. So what we're left with is a situation where we've got uh, Bucket Snijinski on 179, J-Mac on 166, Captain Mads on 158, Grey Crow on 151, and Joel on 134, and then it falls away quite a bit. But as I promised you, everyone is in with a chance to win this competition, uh, the case of beer, and so the last round is going to be... Uh, uh, a bit different to what we usually have on Game of Crows. Um, so I'll just put it up on the screen for people who are looking at uh, Facebook. But essentially what we've got is a situation where I want you to pick the winner of each game, including the margin. So it's basic, the final round is basically a tipping round. So you'll pick uh, each game, uh, the winner of each game plus a margin. Now, the points are going to be awarded as follows. You'll get 20 points per winner that you pick. Um, you'll get plus or minus points on the margin. So if you pick the winner by 20 uh, and the winner wins by 10, you'll get minus 10. If you pick the loser by 20 and the, win and the winner wins by 10, you'll get minus 30. Okay, and if you happen to pick the winner and the correct margin for a particular game, you'll get 50 bonus points. 
So there is a maximum of 450 points available uh, this week on Game of Crows, which essentially gives everyone an opportunity to win. Although uh, with the participation bonus, it actually uh, we're still in, we're favouring those people who have been uh, regular entries every every week. So the case of beer is on the line. Uh, if there's any doubt, I'll put those uh, conditions on Twitter and in Big Footy and on Facebook and everywhere else. Um, but that's how it is, Donkey. Yep. <laughs> and of course, Crow's cast members aren't uh, entitled to participate. So sorry, Peter J. I had to block you out. I thought we were eligible to win, just not. In, no, ineligible to win, but we're allowed to participate. Well, you can participate. I'm just not keeping track of your score. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Pete. I know you were looking no forward. I thought you. Were lo- I, was- I know you were looking forward to the beer. I'm still here. (laughs) All right. Without further ado, and after all that, uh, let's get on to our favourite segment. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, I am a scrubby old man. That's what I am. And I really don't care who knows it. I don't know. Well, it's sweet. It's back to (laughs) time. Come on, mate. You've got to fire up for this. This is your moment. Well, no, first of all, we did a couple of sweets. Firstly, Andy Otten, the old war horse approaching into his career, we'd all written him off, and he came in there and he stood Ben Brown, uh, who's a, a, a real, oh, there's not going to be no blue language, but only magic. Um, uh, he's a, a star full forward and kept him to no goals. And uh, well done, Andy, because we, you know, we've all written you off ages ago, and yet every time you come in, mate, you give 100% and do a, a pretty good game. So, a big sweet to Andy Otten. Slow also start, Macca. Slow start. And uh, another one to Gallucci, young gun in the making. Uh, he emerged, I think, on uh, the game on Saturday night and showed us a little bit of what we're going to get next year in lunch. So uh, that's a sweet to him. <sighs> uh, from the smacks. Pl- <sighs> <sighs> well, I'm happy to stop now if you want. Well, but- we're just can used to a bit of you- fire and brimstone. <laughs> well. You guys, it's done all my line because I've got to give real big smacks to Chapman and Fagan, who yeah. I think... Oh, that's who boring. I, that's every bloody week. Well, they're letting the bloody club down, mate, because <laughs> they should be going to external review because then they'd get reviewed as well. Maybe they aren't the right people for the job. So, you know, um, it's easy to cover up your mistakes and the people you've hired who turn out to be bloody duds um, and make uh, mistakes. And when you do, you're making the uh, uh, judgments yourself, I mean, when you get an external review, at least you're going to get an honest comment. And yes, Burton is a dickhead. Oh, yeah, drink. Drink. Hey, <laughs> <no>. <laughs> and, and so, from a great big whack over the head for both these guys because I think they've done it the bloody easy way. Cover up them, cover up their big bugger ups that they've appointed incompetent people to the job, and uh, well, they've just let the whole club down. And hopefully, it's a one-off, and that the next year they get it right. But if they don't get it right, they've got to go as well. That's well, it. I can't disagree with anything, Macca. No, I can't argue with that. <laughs> Stole my line. Uh, really. thank, uh, um, uh, um. <laughs> thank God we got one intelligent member in the in the panel. Oh, right over your head. <laughs> Thanks, mate. Right over Jeez. your head, Macca. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there is another smack. Uh, did anyone catch the bloody Gil McLaughlin reaching out to Waleed Ali to get his thoughts on the state of the AFL game? Did anyone see oh, that? Uh, look, it was a, it was a bit of a beat up. It was running the Herald Sun, and then Ali's just come straight out and denied it. That's not happening. So I think it's just a beat up. Yeah, but he was con- he was sought out by Gill. It might not have been for a state of the game chat, but why why is Gill even bloody talking to that idiot? Yeah, clickbait. Sid Crow's got it all covered there. Clickbait is all it was. I'm pretty sure. Right. Okay. Just to stir up the grumpy old man like you, mate. Well, yeah. you know, it bloody worked. <laughs> bloody worked. You know, I want to give a sweet out. Oh, right. I um, didn't even see Beveridge's comments about uh, Carlton not shouldn't be getting priority picks, you know, right after their first pick. It should be at the end of the um, the end of the first round at least. That was I usually think he's a dickhead, um, but uh, that was the one thing I've agreed with Bevo saying. At about three thousand comments that guy's made, that's the first time we've ever agreed with him. 
Yeah. Uh, only because his whinging aligned with my whinging. So that's probably the only reason I'm agreeing with it. But uh, it was still a whinge. People having a crack at us about, you know, not getting our facts right about Waleed Ali on the Spreaker chat. They've got to understand that Macca's Sweets and Smacks is the very moment in the podcast where all facts go out of the window. We don't care about facts at this point. We just want to vent. Right. So, Brent, you're probably right. It was a load of bullshit, but we don't care. We just want to vent at this point. Macca, you didn't vent right. hard enough. Well, I listen to their bullshit, and we read their <laughs> bullshit, so I just give them something back. Uh, look, I think we're done, aren't we? <laughs> we, are. <clears throat> we are. Look, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us on Spreaker and Facebook. Uh, don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, aflcrocast.com. If you're listening to us on iTunes, you can leave us a review. You can listen to us everywhere uh, at any time on demand. Don't forget to join us on Sunday for the weekend wrap. Until then, thanks, Macca. Thanks, everyone, and good night. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Yeah, good, good night, all. <laughs>